Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, we looking, was looking forward all summer to escaping the humidity and the heat of Baltimore this time of year. Of course, uh, from what I gather, the heat down there has abated, but uh, nonetheless, it's a great place to be. And uh, thank you to uh, uh, Vermont Law School, to the administration and the faculty and the staff, and uh, especially to Melissa and to Courtney uh, for uh, making me feel as welcome as I am and, and for having me as a media fellow. It's a, you know, it's a great chance for a young journalist like me to get a chance to learn something about the envir environmental law. And it's a kind of a come full circle because when I went to college a few years ago, uh, I was planning to be a lawyer. And in fact, I took the LSATs and uh, if I can dig up my scores, I might just send them in. But I had a chance uh, of taking a course here uh, from Bill Eubanks uh, to, uh, to learn a little bit about what law students have to go through. And I can tell you it's hard work. I don't know, it's uh, a little daunting. So I might rethink that now. <clears throat> now, though, it's uh, time for me to repay you all for your generosity by uh, entertaining you over lunch. And uh, you know, it's a bit of a tall order for an ink-stained wretch like me. Uh, I'll give it a try. One of the, uh, my topic here today, of course, is the Chesapeake Bay. How many of you, I've got to show a hand so I can figure out, how many of you know all about the Chesapeake Bay? John, okay, just a couple. Uh, I know, how many know a lot, okay? <laughs> All right, so basically everybody knows where it is. We don't have to go through that. Uh, I started covering the Bay restoration effort in 1984, shortly after it was formally launched. Uh, I've covered other things at the Sun over that time. Melissa ran through some of my beats. Uh, but I always found my way back to it, uh, or as close as I could get. Uh, that old saying about the way to a man's heart is through his stomach is, is really true in my case. Uh, I grew up in West Virginia, pretty far from the Bay, uh, but not that far, actually, as it turns out. But I've always loved seafood, and my favorite food of all times are oysters. So naturally, uh, I felt drawn to that place that was uh, you know, once known, at least by, to the Native Americans, as that great shellfish bay. The bay was, and still is, amazingly productive. It's got uh, some 2,700 different species of plant and animal. 348 fish species and 173 different shellfish species. Uh, those settlers uh, who established the first English colony in North America, sorry, not the pilgrims, uh, were blown away by its abundance. John Smith of Pocahontas fame wrote the, uh, the line that I used uh, for uh, sort of my introduction here, um, that heaven and earth never agreed better to frame a place, oh, I got my little marker here in the wrong place now, oh, hold on. Never, never agreed better to frame a place for man's habitation. He wrote that oysters lay as thick as stones in the water. And that fish of all types and sizes were so abundant, they tried to catch them with a frying pan. Didn't work. Uh, but he said basically that stir there were more sturgeon in the water than could be devoured by dog or man. Well, that might have been a bit of 17th century real estate shtick because the Jamestown colony never nearly starved to death not, not long after they settled here. But over the past four centuries, it's proven to be a real draw. Nearly 17 me million people now live in that land of pleasant living as it's come to be known. The bay has suffered as a result. Today, oysters are at historic lows and the bay's sturgeon are on the endangered species list. Only about a third of the deeper waters of the bay and the tidal reaches of its rivers have enough oxygen in the summertime for fish and shellfish to breathe easily. So as you no doubt already know, the bay is North America's largest estuary. It's also a major test case of whether we can restore and maintain the vitality of a large coastal ecosystem in the face of continuing population growth and development plus sea level rise and all the other byproducts of global climate change. The states and the federal government are trying practically every legal tool in the book that they have under the Clean Water Act and even the Clean Air Act, and some that may or may not be legal, such as nutrient trading. The outcome remains in doubt. So this is a story I've been following for nearly 30 years now, shortly after that first formal agreement to restore the bay was signed in 1983. It didn't happen overnight, this agreement, this effort to, to save the Bay. It began actually in the 1970s, when in response to growing concerns among conservationists 
uh, one of Maryland's senators, a liberal Republican, uh, that creature that doesn't exist anymore, kind of like Vermont's Bob Stafford, uh, got Congress to fund a, a, a study of what was wrong with the Bay. And when that came out, it proved to be the impetus for that first Bay Agreement in the fall of 1983. Uh, that first agreement was a simple one-page pledge, four paragraphs, uh, to work together to restore the Bay, however that, whatever that took. Uh, there was a tremendous flurry of interest. There was great enthusiasm at the time. Maryland's governor then, Harry Hughes, uh, recalls when he rode around in the traditional Fourth of July parades at that time, the people in the crowd, you know, these days they would yell at you about taxes. They shouted out at him to save the Bay, do something. He tried. He got uh, legislation passed in 1984, landmark legislation for us, uh, to regulate waterfront development. It's a law that uh, I seriously doubt would pass today, at least not in its present form. But he also had to take some fairly draconian action. Uh, not long after that, he had to place a moratorium on the catching of our signature fin fish, the striped bass, rockfish, which had been declining and were at the brink of collapse. And that wasn't even the first fishing ban that he put in. He imposed a ban three years earlier than that on American shad, uh, one of those fish that, in addition to oysters that we used to eat in West Virginia every spring. That was in 1981. Yeah, let me remember how to do this here. Early on, there were a lot of theories about what was wrong with the bay and its fish. Pesticides and herbicides were among the prime suspects. But the scientists eventually focused in on that lack of dissolved oxygen in the bay's waters as a leading source of stress on fish and shellfish. And uh, the, the, the causative factor were nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, sediment. A few years later, in 1987, after uh, pressing the scientists to give them their best estimate of what it would take to clean up the bay, the governors and EPA came together again to sign a new agreement, this time pledging to cut that nutrient pollution by 40% by the year 2000. The millennium sounded great. Uh, I was a younger man then. That was a seven-page agreement. It also talked about controlling the impacts of population growth and development, identifying and controlling those toxic pollutants out there that might be uh, affecting fish and, and potentially human health. It was seen at the time as bold and ambitious, but doable. Back then, saving the bay was fresh and urgent, and there was a sense of momentum. While daunting, few thought it would drag on this long. We had a lot to learn. The agreements, though, drove governors and legislatures to act. Maryland adopted laws to protect wetlands, to conserve forests, to fund upgrades of sewage treatment plants. Not much was being done about farm runoff at the time, though, and curbing sprawl was proving pretty politically tough. Uh, by 1997, another governor, uh, a guy named Glenn Denning, pushed through uh, what was known as a smart growth law. Um, it's a weak sister compared to Vermont's Act 250, I can tell you. But it was an attempt to steer growth back to cities and towns using the power of the state's purse strings. As we see over time, those strings, it's kind of hard to push growth using a string. Yep. Oh, now I messed up here. Pardon me one second while I find my place again. The impact of agriculture, though, was, was getting glossed over, at least initially. As densely populated as Maryland is, farming is a very big industry there, especially poultry farming. Maryland produces about 300 million chickens a year. That's uh, more than 50 times the state's human population. And the entire Bel Delmarva Peninsula yields 560 million chickens a year. So you can see the situation here. I should probably flip through some of these slides. I did this once before. I got so wrapped up in talking, I never showed you anything. These are, if it works, and it doesn't, hold on. Here we go. All right. So this is the old bay. Uh, Aubrey Bodine, one of our famous sun photographers took this picture in the 40s of skipjacks. There's my favorite food. There we are dining on crabs, rockfish. That enthusiasm. There we have growth. There's our current governor learning about the bay, and here we are. Anyway, agriculture was a problem. But in 1997, we began to wake up to the problem. That was the year when we had a series of fish kills. And these were kind of gruesome because the fish were turning up with 
sores and lesions all over their bodies. Scarier than that, though, was that the fishermen who were working in the area of the fish kills were starting to complain of uh, neurological problems, memory loss and confusion. Uh, human health seemed to be affected. The public kind of panicked a little bit. They stopped eating fish of all types, no matter where it came from. Uh, and, uh, you know, and the scientists uh, sort of pinpointed at the time what they thought was the critter that was causing this, a, a, a microbe called Fisteria, which was said to attack fish and people alike with a flesh-eating poison. They've later figured out it was another algae, harmful algae altogether, but at the same time, the scientists did point out that all the fish kills were happening on that eastern shore on the Delmarva Peninsula, which was dominated by agriculture at the time. I don't know if I've got that slide. Oh, this thing does not work. Here we go. Let's try this. Uh, let me show you here. This is a little map of uh, the Delmarva Peninsula. You may not be able to read the graph there, but the, red, you know, the deeper the color, the more chickens per acre. So you can sort of see it's very intense. In 97, uh, they woke up to this. Uh, they realized, the scientists pointed out, farming and agricultural runoff was the major source of pollution on the eastern shore. Uh, and that up to that point, relatively little had been done about it. We had relied on farmers' goodwill. We had a, a enlisted them in voluntary reductions, planting uh, trees along the stream, leaving uh, you know, stream buffers, uh, and uh, offering them financial incentives to do what they ought to be doing. 1998, the state adopted regulations for the first time on fertilizer use. Uh, they were rather seriously compromised in a number of ways. Um, but that was the first step, in the very, at the very least. By the late 1990s, though, it had become apparent that the states and EPA were not going to meet that millennium deadline, the 2000 deadline for restoring the bay. So the governors and EPA got together again and signed a new agreement. This one was 13 pages. 102 specific goals to reduce pollution, increase habitat for fish and wildlife, promote sound land use. It also committed the state and the federal governments yet again to render the bay free of toxic pollution. This time they pledged to get it done by 2010, 10 years. Well, in 2008, just two years before that deadline, it became apparent that the bay remained pretty much as polluted with nutrients and sediment as it had been at the outset of the restoration campaign in the early 80s. The governors and EPA acknowledged later that they weren't going to make that latest cleanup deadline, and they needed to pick up the pace of restoration work to make any real progress. They agreed at that time to set a series of two-year milestones to goad themselves along, to make themselves more accountable. But by then, we were entering what uh, you might call a new era of regulation, driven by and prompting a flurry of litigation. The EPA had been sued by environmental groups in the late 1990s for not pushing the states to deal with the fact that the bay and most of its tributaries were impaired by nutrients and sediment. The agency entered consent decrees in 1999, pledging to draw up uh, TMDLs, the total maximum daily loads. I don't need to tell anybody here what that is, do I? Um, those were at the time aimed primarily at Virginia and, and District of Columbia waters, the Potomac and the Anacostia. For some reason, it took the EPA another decade to actually get serious about drawing up those TMDLs. About the same time, maybe there was a coincidence, uh, a new administration came in in Washington. And President Obama, pressed by environmentalists, declared the Bay a national treasure and ordered federal agencies to take the lead in cleanup efforts. So late in 2010, three years ago, a little over, Almost. The EPA finally produced a TMDL, Pollution Reduction Plan, for the entire Bay Watershed. This is a huge watershed. It covers six states, it reaches as far north as Cooperstown, not that far from here. Uh, and it's probably the most ambitious and largest and most complicated one of any of these that's ever been proposed. That pollution diet, as we in the news media like to dumb it down, has been pushing states for the past three years to step up their efforts. In Maryland, uh, legislators have tightened that 20-plus-year-old uh, law regulating waterfront development, which actually had a bunch of holes in it. They put limits on where and how homes can be built using septic tanks off of sewage treatment systems. 
It's also led to an outpouring of public money for farmers to keep animal manure and fertilizer from washing off their fields by planting winter cover crops, stream buffers, and, and the like. It's also led to some increased regulations of large scale and medium poultry farms. And it's led to urban and suburban residents and businesses being asked to pay new fees for upgrading sewage treatment plants and retrofitting storm drains. The results so far have been what you'd call mixed. The politicians, the bureaucrats, and others can point to a, a growing pile of laws and regulations, rising expenditures and programs to reduce pollution. The scientists say, modeling the results say we're making progress, that the estimated loads of nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediments getting into the bay and its tributaries are decreasing. In the water itself, there's evidence that phosphorus is down, but the progress on nitrogen, which is the other nutrient, unlike the sh Lake Champlain, which is mainly affected by phosphorus, the bay gets of both. Progress on nitrogen has been modest at best. Much of that progress has come from a very uh, different legal direction, not the Clean Water Act, but the Clean Air Act. EPA estimates that uh, regulations on power plant emissions and on vehicle emissions have, uh, have reduced the amount of nitrogen falling out of the air onto the bay watershed by about 10%. That's about a third of all the nitrogen reductions that have been made, made so far, kind of an unusual benefit of national action. But the bay hasn't exactly come roaring back. It's uh, hard to see much real improvement amid the dramatic swings and conditions that we see from year to year, depending on the weather. Earlier this year, for instance, the authorities reported that bay grasses, uh, officially known as submerged aquatic vegetation, those things that are really important for fish and crabs to hang out in, to find shelter from predators and f to find food, they've declined by 44% in the last three years the time that we're supposedly ramping things up, making progress. This is reversing about, practically entirely reversing about 15 years of improvement in those grasses. And the bay's crabs. This is the critter that's become synonymous with Maryland and the heart of what remains of our region's seafood industry also took a dive in the past year after appearing to rebound from serious collapse about five years ago. It's not all bad news. Let me give you a different picture or two to look at here while we're at it. Here's our uh, poultry houses. There's a guy scraping out the poultry manure. It's a dry kind of manure, unlike your cow manure. Uh, and, uh, and it poses uh, special challenges there. Uh, one of the uh, things offsetting a little bit those Clean Air Act improvements we've seen in the nitrogen is that actually they've also measured an uptick in ammonia, primarily coming from agriculture into the air. These are the bay grasses I was talking about, a lot less than there used to be. And here are our crabs, still the primary seafood and the pillar of our seafood industry these days. A few oysters. Anyway, it's not all bad news. The oysters are starting to come back, it appears, a bit. Um, and that's good news for me. I love to eat them. So, uh, so we like that part. But even that has to be put into perspective. Like I said, the oysters are at 1% of their historic levels. So they're not going to save the bay anytime soon, even though they were famous filter feeders in their day. Meanwhile, the EPA has been sued. Let me see here. I think I jumped ahead a little bit. Yeah. Hold on one second. I'm working with a computer that isn't my regular one. Ah, here we go. So, anyway, many of the setbacks that I told you about earlier could be written off as natural variations, something that we basically can't control. Some scientists see amid the gyrations of the water conditions a trend line of, of gradually improve, gradual improvement over the last 25 to 30 years. It's small, but the signal is there. And that's what keeps them going. That's what gives them hope. Uh, and the whole issue is, can we persist? If we keep on, if we keep up the pressure, will we, in fact, turn the tide? It's not entirely clear, while we're in the middle of it, that that's going to happen. Sticking to that pollution diet is proving hard to do. The American Farm Bureau and farm groups are suing EPA at this time to overturn that baywide TMDL, arguing that the EPA has overstepped its legal authority and that it's based on bad science. 
The case was uh, argued in a Pennsylvania federal court last fall. We're still waiting for a decision. Uh, EPA is also being sued by a West Virginia chicken farmer that they tried to get uh, required to get a permit as a concentrated animal feeding operation. She uh, disagreed with them, said her runoff was agricultural runoff, which is exempt from regulation under the Clean Water Act. EPA backed up and said, oh, you don't need a permit, but she's pursuing the suit anyway. Depending on what happens, this could affect EPA's ability to regulate poultry operations. There's been other litigation too, um, also with somewhat mixed results. Uh, the Waterkeeper Alliance Environmental Group, you may have heard about them. Uh, they won a Pyrrhic victory suing a, a poultry farm and the uh, poultry giant poultry company Purdue, uh, getting a ruling from a federal judge that uh, the large poultry companies could be held legally liable for pollution caused by farmers who were raising chickens uh, under contract to them. Uh, however, uh, the alliance failed to prove its case in court. The judge found that uh, they didn't have the evidence that there was pollution from the poultry operation. And in fact, he was uh, so unimpressed with their case that he's now considering whether to award legal fees to Purdue and the poultry farmer. They've asked for more than $3 million. That also is waiting action. EPA, uh, just to add to the burden, EPA lost a case in Virginia recently where they were trying to regulate stormwater. Uh, it's raised a little bit of question about exactly what you can require to be regulated as far as regulating stormwater runoff. So there's been, as I said, a number of these uh, court cases out here. It appears in some ways that uh, EPA is, is getting a little more tentative about what it's going to do about stormwater and about CAFOs, about agricultural runoff. There was an agreement, one of the uh, environmental groups, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, had won an agreement in 2010, one of those settlements, uh, to, uh, that EPA promised that they would generate rulemaking on stormwater and on CAFOs. And, uh, Neither of those is forthcoming. The Bay Foundation recently let uh, EPA off the hook, if you will, by uh, allowing them to forego issuing a, a national rulemaking on that if they would just look at, a little more carefully at, the, uh, at a few uh, CAFOs chicken operations in the Bay watershed. With this evidence out there, there's still state action, and Maryland uh, is arguably leading the efforts to restore the Bay throughout the region. Uh, under pressure from the TMDL to meet its pollution reduction targets, Maryland has imposed some new regulations on farming, uh, some for the first time. They're now requiring livestock to be fenced away from streams, requiring manure to be stored under roof to uh, cut the runoff from it, um, and they're requiring them to work that dry manure into the soil to prevent it from running off when uh, they typically put it out in the wintertime when there's nothing growing, and, uh, and it winds up right in the bay. But and this is a trend that I've seen over 30 years. Those regulations, like many of the laws that appeared very ambitious when they were proposed, were compromised before it being adopted. And the most important ones don't even take effect for another two years. The truth is that other states aren't even doing as much as Maryland is in a lot of ways. Even in Maryland, though, rural and some suburban counties, politicians, are questioning what the state is now saying they have to do in terms of controlling stormwater runoff in terms of upgrading their wastewater treatment plants. And there's at least an implied threat of legal action there. A group of rural counties have retained a law firm. They've been writing letters challenging the TMDL, challenging the whole basis for, uh, for the uh, pollution reduction plans. And what's driving this to a degree are that uh, the costs, the estimated costs of actually doing all this uh, look pretty daunting. The overall estimated cost for Maryland of achieving its uh, goals under the TMDL were on the order of $15 billion. Now that's stretched out to 2025, but most people don't actually think of it that way. They see the 15 billion and think that's a lot of money. And you know, when they start bringing it down to individual communities, some of them are saying that they alone have to spend a billion dollars and they don't like that. They don't want to raise taxes. Nobody ever does. One possible antidote to those costs that's being explored now, and it's actually becoming, I guess, sort of a, the saving grace, if you will, to, to some, is pollution trading, nutrient trading. If we can get the, uh, the communities to avoid those steep bills 
for upgrading sewage plants or reducing stormwater by paying farmers to curb runoff. That's always a lot cheaper. It's a lot cheaper to build a shed over that pound for pound. The reductions are a lot less, orders of magnitude le less in terms of the cost. You can get more bang for your buck that way. And so what they've, all the states are doing is drawing up plans for encouraging trading of nutrient pollution uh, in which you can buy credits. Farmers who have actually done everything that they're supposed to do under the Clean Water Act uh, and under the TMDL could then do a little more and potentially sell that, make some money off of it uh, to uh, cities and counties that uh, are uh, you know, choking on the price tag of having to upgrade their sewage treatment plant one more time or, uh, or rip up uh, pavement and put in uh, uh, grass strips and this sort of thing. It's not entirely clear just how those are going to work. Every state has its own plan. EPA is still studying them. And there are those who are worried that, uh, that this lacks accountability and transparency. Uh, those things are promised, but we have yet to actually see them in place. And uh, from what little I've seen so far, each state is taking a somewhat different tack on it. Pennsylvania seems pretty, uh, pretty generous with their trades. Maryland hasn't done any yet. They're very cautious. Virginia is just starting. And in truth, uh, some environmental groups have also filed suit challenging EPA's authority to approve a trading program like this. So again, there's a question about whether it's going to work. It is seen as, in Maryland anyway, what's going to help us hold the line. Because the fact is, with the TMDL, in the end, what you have to do is once you reach that pollution reduction target, you have to stay there. And so if you have any new growth, any new development, if your population grows, you have to offset that. And that means you have to reduce still more. And so they're looking to trading. Rather than forcing uh, you know, costly upgrades, they're going to see if they can't squeeze it out of as much as they can out of farmers. It's not entirely clear that farmers are going to buy this either. They're kind of suspicious of government right now, any program, even one that offers them money. So meanwhile, that toxic contamination of the bay that exists in its sediments and some in its water remains a more or less unresolved issue. Well, those pledges in the uh, Bay Agreements to do something about it really haven't done a whole lot. There have been reductions, to be sure. Our factories are mostly closed. Um, I think I've got one on here. That's, uh, that's the Clean Air Act helping us out. There's uh, Sparrows Point, Bethlehem Steel. Decades, that was a toxic hotspot. Still pretty toxic. It's shut down now, and they're trying to decide what to do with it. But the legacy of all the stuff that's there means that there are uh, spots around the bay where you're advised not to eat the fish uh, because of the PCBs and uh, pesticide residues and everything else. And Baltimore happens to be one of those places. Uh, federal government reported earlier this year they found that basically three-fourths of the bay's tidal waters are, are still fully or partially impaired by toxic chemicals. So, uh, and some of the fish have what we would call gender issues. Um, and reproduction isn't so good of some others. One thing scientists aren't quite sure why, they don't know whether it's pharmaceuticals, ag runoff, uh, just plain physical development of the watershed. One of the things they find is a coincidence perhaps, they've noticed that fish and uh, aquatic bug populations start to take a dive once your development in a given watershed reaches about 10 or 15 percent. So that you know, if nothing else, you've got a, an indicator there of what's going wrong. So that's, uh, but that again has not been actually sort of built into any kind of regulatory program. Population growth, as I mentioned before, also looms as a potential neutralizer to that restoration effort. If we can't figure out how to fi offset the impacts of that growth, we're going to be in trouble. Uh, from 85 until t 2005, um, the first 20 some years of the Bay restoration effort, population grew by nearly 25 percent. And during that time, we basically held our own. It didn't get worse, but it didn't get a whole lot better. Development pressure has eased up a lot since then, but it's still about 160,000 people coming into the region every year. It's a big region, 64,000 square miles. By some estimates, population could reach or approach 20 million by 2030 from 17 now. So it's, it's, there's significant impacts there. And finally, climate change. That's our Bay uh, Health Report card. Here's our population. They're coming over the Bay Bridge. Talk about climate change. 
it could wreak still more havoc. Rising water temperatures could well alter the species mix in the ecosystem. And rising sea level makes our coastal communities much more vulnerable to storms. This picture is of uh, Baltimore. After, uh, which one was that, Bob? The uh, 2003, uh, Isabel, Tropical Storm Isabel. So, rising waters also may drown our many tidal wetlands. Uh, these are the essential sponges to help filter out some of that pollution and provide habitat for, for the fish and wildlife that we were so famous for. Those engaged in trying to restore the bay recognize all that. So the EPA and the states are in the process of drawing up yet another bay agreement. Hoping to sign it this fall. Uh, this one, the nutrient pollution is supposedly being taken care of by the TMDL. This one's going to focus on restoring those fisheries that are still down. The American shad moratorium since 1981 have yet to be restored in the Bay. They're not entirely sure why. Um, this one's going to focus on fisheries, on habitat, some of those other issues not directly dealt with through the TMDL. They're proposing to do it the old-fashioned way with another voluntary cooperative agreement, just like the, the other ones where they missed the deadline. But they say this one's going to be different somehow. It's going to be more transparent, more accountable. Uh, the draft right now is pretty short on specifics, so we're waiting to see. So, 30 years after the beginning of the campaign to save the Chesapeake, its fate's still very much in doubt. Maybe the most important lesson from the past three decades is that we're never going to be done with that Herculean task and that the bay is going to require constant management if it's going to continue to harbor crabs and fish and the oysters that I love. And the biggest challenge of all may be to keep the public interested and supportive, willing to pay for and participate in what ultimately is an unending stewardship of this vast ecosystem. And this story, which I wondered once how it was going to turn out, looks like it's going to go on for long after I've stopped scribbling. Thanks very much. These are just a few pictures here I'll show you before I, I, I messed up with the timing here. I got to get my uh, wrap down. This is uh, the last house on Holland's Island, one of the uh, vanishing islands in the bay. Sea level is already rising at a faster rate there than anywhere else in the, uh, along the East Coast. And uh, this house hasn't been occupied for some time, obviously, but it fell in a couple years ago when we went out to document it. Uh, and that was the, uh, this island where it was, was once the home of a thriving fishing community. This graveyard you see here in one of my favorite photographs from one of our photographers was of the, uh, one of the two graveyards. They had a, this community had uh, everything, a store, a main street, a, a band, a ball team, uh, and all that disappeared over 100 years ago, or roughly 100 years ago. And that's us slogging on. So thank you again. Any questions, anybody? communities along the bay preparing for, for that expected sea level rise? Well, like everything else, it varies because, you know, the, the federal government is giving a huge push on that. Um, Maryland uh, recently issued a report, got some scientists together, the governor asked them for advice on how to plan, and they advised uh, folks to get ready, you know, at the outside, and this is the, you know, the possibly the extreme, could be three feet by 2050. Uh, so that's huge. Yeah, yeah. Uh, more likely, you know, on the order of one and a half, one, somewhere in there. But that's more than double what historically the level had been. And that, it, you know, again, on the outside, it could be upwards of seven feet by the end of the century. And, you know, when you start to draw maps to look at where the elevations are, that puts a lot of the Delmarva Peninsula underwater. Uh, that puts Smith and Tangier Islands, our last populated islands in the bay, in, in serious jeopardy. Uh, one of the little stories I did this year was a, a little kerfuffle there where uh, uh, Sandy, which did so much damage to New York and New Jersey, pretty much passed Maryland by with one, one small exception. Uh, it was a huge storm swirling this way. And so some of those back winds from the backside of that storm blew water across the bay from like the Potomac River up against the uh, eastern shore around Crisfield which was Maryland's traditional seafood capital. It's the place where all the oysters and the crabs, still the heart of our crabbing country. Uh, and they got hit, they got hammered. A lot of homes destroyed, hundreds of cars ruined. 
uh, there's still people living in trailers over there. I mean, it was kind of ignored because of this extreme devastation in New York and everywhere else, but th that one county got hit hard. Um, as part of that, there was a little bit of federal money. The Congress did provide some disaster revenue. Maryland got a little chunk of that, and they earmarked it all for Somerset County. And I think the state was trying to think progressively, but they didn't really communicate this well. They said, for, we're going to make money available to rebuild Chrisfield. For you folks out there on Smith Island, 10 miles out in the bay, we're going to offer you money to move off the island. And it was not taken well by the people there. They're kind of a rugged lot. And, uh, and they rose up in, uh, in objection to that. Uh, and after back and forth, it was pulled back. But so the state is trying to do some things. They're trying to encourage the counties to plan for sea level rise, uh, to change their building codes and their zoning codes. Uh, flood insurance is part of the, the, the push there. And one of those quirky things, the, we're getting new flood insurance maps. They don't necessarily reflect projected sea level rise, though, they only deal with historical storms, and not even the impact of Isabel is actually built into their, their rates. But there are pressures because of all the damage that has happened nationwide. Flood insurance rates overall are going up astronomically. And so even if you're not in a higher danger zone, your rates are going up. And one way that you can reduce those rates is by requiring new homes to be built above, well above the flood uh, hazard zone, and, uh, and so that's one of the things that's actually being looked at. Baltimore has uh, got a disaster plan that they're looking at right now that would include increased freeboard to some degree. So, uh, but again, counties are basically on their own. Each one gets to decide. Yeah? Uh, one thing I noticed you didn't mention is that in your regulatory moratorium for agriculture bill that kind of split the environmental community yeah. and got enacted with only the Chesapeake Bay Foundation going along with it. Right. Yeah, I mean, as, again, sort of as the rubber hits the road, you're starting to see these real frictions, disagreements, not over whether we should clean up the bay, but how to do it and how best to do it. Um, there was a, each of the states actually has adopted or is in the process of adopting this thing called agricultural certainty. It's the old safe harbor idea, which is, I guess has been floated at the national level. Uh, essentially, if farmers agree to a certain level of, of pollution reduction or to put certain best management practices on their land to reduce runoff, then they would be sort of uh, freed from having to do anything else for a certain period of time. Um, in Maryland, that translated into 10 years, a long time. Um, you know, the argument for it is that they're going to actually do more than they're currently being required, and Maryland is requiring probably more than, than most of the other states. Uh, it's not entirely clear how that's going to work out, but there was such a groundswell of support for this. I got to think in part because of the backlash from the Waterkeeper case. I mean, farming is really pretty powerful politically in Maryland still. Uh, it, it sailed through. Um, the Bay Foundation supported it. They're the biggest environmental group, certainly the most uh, affluent uh, and the best connected one there, and they actually supported it. Uh, the argument is that it's going to be transparent, but it won't be transparent to me because in Maryland, you're not allowed to see the nutrient management plans, the ma manure management plans of farmers. Uh, they pass that law that was passed way back in the 90s to make them develop manure management plans exempted those from public information. So only the state regulators get to see them. And we have to pretty much trust that they're going to do their job. Uh, and this ag certainty thing appears to be falling into that same boat. But Virginia and Pennsylvania and I think Delaware are in the process of doing similar kinds of things. And you may hear about them in other states. I think one or two other states actually have similar programs, Bob, is that right? Yeah, so um, it's, it's sort of a coming thing. Part of the, you know, if the Champlain TM deal gets really serious, farmers here may be clamoring for ag certainty. Um, how are you, you going to uh, cover the trading regimes? Is this something that you and your, your bosses at the paper, Baltimore Sun are talking about or other journalists at SEJ are talking about? Because for better or for worse, it, it's the policy instrument of choice. Uh, it, there's no yeah. question about it. That's, that's the only realistic handle on nonpoint. That's what they're going to use it in the Mississippi and everywhere else. Um, the, the, the success, there's, there's definitely been success with trading in, in, in 
in, uh, in Long Island Sound. But so okay. far, it's been point to point, not point to non point so much. Right. It's moving up the watershed. It's going to the non point. It's clearly heading in that direction. So, what, what's the strategy for trying to penetrate the gaming that clearly is going to go on? Well, again, I think you just have to sort of examine these as closely as you can. It's yeah, it's true. It's been sort of coming for some time. Yeah. I can remember hosting a, a sort of a mini panel discussion on that at a SEJ conference six years ago. And at that time, we were hearing from North Carolina that it wasn't such a good thing, because they had had some trading going on down there. Um, point to point is uh, is accountable, because they're operating under permits. You can measure it. You can see it. Uh, it gets much more challenging when you're trying to account for you know non-point runoff. There, you know, some of the this things that they're talking about are basically requiring a, a you know a cushion, you know, because all you can do is estimate the, the nutrient runoff from a from a particular BMP. And some of these BMPs haven't really been thoroughly vetted to tell if they actually work. That's actually ongoing, even as they're drawing up these plans. So that's, again, it's a moving target. Um, I'm, you know, frankly, pollution trading is probably at the top of my list of things to investigate. Does SEJ want to do something on this? Uh, I don't know if they're going to do anything this year, but we should. We should. Yep, we should revisit it. I mean, it's becoming more real, uh, very real. We're hoping to, to meet in Washington in a few years, so maybe we can get back to it. Oh, I'm sorry. Society of Environmental Journalists. It's a national group, actually international even, of uh, journalists who uh, cover the environment. Um, it's uh, somehow in the uh, turmoil of the uh, media world has remained uh, vital and lost some members, but not that many. I'm a dinosaur. There aren't nearly as many newspaper reporters as there used to be. And that's one of the challenges about doing something about pollution trading. I've been talking about doing something about it for two years and getting the time to do it. Is a, is a bigger challenge. Okay, good. Yes. My name is Charles White. I'm a port commissioner for the Port of Baltimore. And I just happened to see this topic in the newspaper, and I couldn't help but call Mr. Wheeler to say that I'd love to come by and just answer some questions. But I'd like to also to talk about an additional stressor that has nothing to do with chemistry or chicken shit. <laughs> it's commerce. Right in the middle of the bay is the Port of Baltimore. Port of Baltimore doesn't pop to your mind as being a big Atlantic port because it's an inland port. It's 100 miles away from the ocean. But it's number nine in terms, it's in the top 10 in America in terms of the value of its commerce. It's number one in the United States in a number of commodity flows, number one in automobiles. At any one point in time, you can find 60,000 automobiles at the port on the ground, ready to be transported. <clears throat> it's number one in what is known as row row commodities, heavy agricultural mining activities that, are, that roll onto the ships. It's number one in forest products import. People just don't think of Baltimore as being that kind of a port. But the great majority of fine printing paper for magazines, brochures, comes from Finland to Baltimore. That's kind of a shrinking market because of the internet. But it's offset by the other kind of forest product that comes in pulp, a growing commodity that comes from Brazil because we all have to go to the bathroom. And as we get older, a bigger population, we go more frequently and we need more toilet paper. It's a perfect, perfect commodity for the future. But again, number one. Number two in America, in export coal. You look at the Chesapeake and you see row after row after row of coal ships taking, you won't like this as environmentalist, taking coal to China. But it's relatively clean Appalachian coal, so there's a little improvement, but it's, it is what it is. We're also number one on the import of salt. If you ever drive through Baltimore on Route 95, you'll see a big pile of salt on one side, the huge coal pile on the other. It's, it, they call it the peppermint salt of, uh, of the port. 
is number two in imports of aluminum and number one on the imports of gypsum. Gypsum goes in the wallboard. Uh, when the building boom comes back, that will be a huge, huge activity. It's the fastest growing port in America, and it's the fastest growing cruise port. Now, having said all that, that just shows you that there's a thousand ships on the Chesapeake Bay a year, commercial ships. But Baltimore is also, because of Maryland's allegiance to the Bay, it goes overboard to be green. It does things that a normal businessman running a port would never do because of the state's concern for the Bay. It's almost like a mantra in Maryland, tre treasure the Chesapeake, Chesapeake Bay. It says so on vanity license plates, that that's, that's, our, that's our trademark to the rest of the, uh, the country. It's also a sign that it's sitting on soft sand. The Bay is a soft bottomed body of water. We have a 50-foot channel, only one of two ports in the East Coast that have a deep channel. We're ready to handle the Panama Canal ships, only two, Norfolk and Baltimore. But that means there's constant dredging. A normal businessman approach to the port would take the dredge material up to the middle of the bay and just drop it. But we don't do that. We incur enormous expenses placing dredge material to replace and rebuild the islands that Mr. Wheeler showed you that are disappearing. We have recreated a wonderful island almost at the mouth of the Baltimore Channel, Hart Miller Island, which is an Audubon Society success story. Very expensive to take the dredge material to dry it, compact it, clean it, and rebuild an island. We rebuilt Poplar Island <clears throat> 50 miles down the bay at enormous expense. And we're looking for other remediation activities that the environmental agency of the state uh, can work with. All of this would retard the growth if we were just driven by economics. My point is that drilled into us when we took our positions when we were sworn in is that we have a commitment to the Bay. The port's important, it builds jobs, but this is kind of the identity of Maryland. And that makes us not reluctant, but willing and uh, proactive join us with the environmental groups. I, I think you've seen that over your history following the port. Maybe there, not, but I think... I have covered, you know, the, uh, the, the islands that uh, Charlie talks about. Poplar Island's a wonderful wildlife refuge. Um, and sure, they have done things to, to uh, rebuild habitat there, to rebuild some islands. Um, it's, you know, it is a business concern. And uh, so, unfortunately, the cost of getting those dredge spoils down, or material, I guess we call it now, down to a place like Smith Island to build it up uh, just as cost prohibitive. And Holland Island, the guy who owned that house there, was begging for stuff and was told basically, you're just too far. Uh, we can't do that just to save one house and one that isn't even occupied. Uh, you know, it, it's true that the, the port is a working concern, uh, that they have, uh, uh, you know, done rehabilitation. There's a nice... Uh, uh, area that they reclaimed inside the harbor, in fact, Masonville Cove. It's uh, been turned into a park and a bit of a wildlife refuge. Uh, it was a toxic dump before. Um, the dredging is necessary to keep the port going. Uh, the dredging poses issues because those sediments, as I told you, are, are pretty toxic in spots. And so, uh, you know, there is a great deal of uh, careful planning that has to go around that and concern about what happens. Uh, the port has actually expressed some interest in that, that uh, chunk of uh, old factory uh, that I told you about, Sparrows Point, 
they want to turn part of that into a, using dredge material and to clean it up, cap it at the very least. Uh, whether that's going to be enough for a sort of a toxic wasteland like that or whether much more cleanup is needed is still to be determined. Um, so uh, I appreciate your uh, bringing that out, Charlie. Yeah. Any other questions before we wrap up? Anyone? Yep. Oh. I already told you oysters are coming back. <laughs> uh, the fact that we haven't blanched so far, I mean, you know, sure, there's been, I mean, you can read this, what's happening here, you can take the historical view, I'm kind of a history buff anyway. You can take the historical view that, you know, politicians have to make deals, they have to compromise in order to go, move forward, they have to take a step back in order to take two steps forward. Maybe that's what's happening here, maybe we're not really going to pull the plug, maybe we're not going to stop, maybe things will keep going, or maybe not. I mean, that's, you know, I can't sound a whole lot more optimistic than that. I mean, uh, time is not on our side in the sense that, you know, those forces I talked about of population and climate change are inexorable. And if we're going to get ahead of them, we really do have to step up the pace and we have to be as accountable as possible along the way. Um, they're talking a good game now. The plan they have in place would, if followed and met, would appear to achieve those pollution reductions they're talking about. What, and what I don't think we know yet is whether that's going to be enough. And, you know, that's where it gets a little tricky with this ag certainty law of starting to promise people that you don't have to do anything for 10 years. Um, you know, we may realize before 10 years is up that we need to do something more or else we're not going to make the progress we need to. And if we give away too many concessions in terms of what people have to do, we're, we're out there. I think the other thing is that people are maybe starting to finally wake up to the fact that saving the bay isn't just an empty slogan. You know, it isn't just buying a Treasure of the Chesapeake license plate, which costs a little bit more. Uh, it's actually paying hard-earned money to own property because you have pavement that runs off. Uh, it's not just pointing at somebody else and saying, you're causing the pollution. Everybody is causing the pollution. One of the favorite slogans of some of the regulators is, we've got to do everything everywhere. You know, I mean, there's a third E in there somewhere, but it's all about basically nobody, nobody gets a free pass. Nobody has done enough. Uh, if we can just keep people with that mentality that they don't get uh, <laughs> fatigued, then uh, we might see some progress. Thank you.